All right, so here we go, jumping into categories of living things. Bacteria and viruses is uh, what chapter 10 is about. Um, chapter 10 actually doesn't give you as much information on viruses as I did, so the lecture should go a little bit further than chapter 10 does on viruses, um, but that's fine. So here we are, chapter 10 in biology. Some general information about bacteria. Take a moment and write that down. So these are the things that surround your world more than anything else. If you were to ask the question, and it probably will be asked of you on an exam, what's the most prolific form of life? What, do, what kinds of living things are there more of than anything else? The answer is bacteria. Um, we are, uh, you know, we consider ourselves the height of creation because we are made in the image of God. And that is absolutely true. You are much, much more important than bacteria. But what did God make more of? Bacteria. Um, what did God make mostly? Bacteria. Um, there are more kinds of bacteria than any other kind of living thing. And there are certainly more individual bacteria than any other kind of living thing. So um, the, the living world around us is more bacteria than anything else. Um, the majority of them are decomposers. And so we are very glad that the world has bacteria. You can worship God for bacteria. Um, and that may not be something that you thought of before, but imagine what would happen if every large living thing that died just sat there. Right? And so there would be a tree that fell over and just just there forever. It, uh, it would be, you, a forest floor would quickly become littered with dead trees and nothing else would be able to grow. Or animals that die would just lay there and be dead. And you would quickly, you know, be tripping over dead ox as you're walking through the prairies, right? Um, or all the fish that die in the ocean just floated, you know. <laughs> nobody would want to go to Waikiki. So, um, we are very, very glad that dead things go away, right? And the reason that dead things go away is mostly because of bacteria. So thank you, Lord, for making bacteria. Um, because we don't want to have dead things all over our world. We like dead things to go away. And another awesome thing about decomposers is trees die, trees fall over, trees decompose, and their stuff, their, their organism material goes into the ground and becomes fertilizer for more plants, right? Um, waste products, poop, goes into the ground and decomposes and becomes fertilizer for plants for food in the future. So, I, I mean, imagine all the poop that would be piled up all over the world if poop never decomposed. We're really glad that God made bacteria. You'd be, you'd be swimming in other people's poop. So, yeah. Um, and there wouldn't be any ability to make food, like decomposers are massively important. So thank you, Lord, for decomposers. Some bacteria are pathogens. And the word pathogen means it's something that gets inside another organism and makes it sick. So decomposers um, are part of the design of creation, part of God's handiwork, and we can worship him for it. Pathogens are part of the fall. Um, they are an aspect of the creation that is the way it is because of sin. So... If you get sick, it's your own fault. Um, maybe not because you put yourself in the way of being ill, but because you are a sinner, and you live in a sinful world, and the sinful world has bugs in it. So bacteria are uh, reflections of God's design as well as reflections of a fallen world. Um, we will look more specifically at some pathogens that make us sick later on with some pretty cool labs that um, demonstrate how Diseases are passed around and things of that nature. Um, bacteria reproduce asexually almost all the time. So when bacteria reproduce, they will go through mitosis, through cell division, and uh, make a copy of its DNA, move a copy to each end of the cell, cut the cell in half, then they grow, and you've got two bacteria. Really, really glad humans don't grow that way, don't reproduce that way, could you imagine? Um, it's time to have a baby, okay, and your bottom half just falls off, and then you <laughs> grow new legs. That would be weird. <laughs> that would be weird, but that's the way the bacteria reproduce. Um, some bacteria do exchange DNA through conjugation. So when something reproduces asexually through binary fission, through mitosis, obviously it's making a clone of itself. 
it is exactly the same genetic information as the parent. But conjugation allows for some genetic mixture. So two bacteria will form a little cytoplasm bridge between them, and they will pass a little bit of DNA back and forth between that cytoplasm bridge. And so now they don't have the same DNA that they used to have, and then they'll divide, and the daughter cells are slightly different. And that is, that's a way for some diversity in sexual recombination to happen in bacteria. But most of the time, bacteria is reproduced through binary fission. Okay, so you get clones of bacteria. Some bacteria make you sick, um, and these are all examples of, bi of bacterial diseases. Um, this is uh, this is just a, a bacterial skin infection. This is MRSA. Oh, I have that. You don't want MRSA. Okay, this is MRSA. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you don't want that. MRSA, MRSA stands for Multiply Resistant Staphylococcus aureolus. Staphylococcus aureolus is the name of the bacteria. Multiply resistant means it is, it's not going to be killed by lots and lots of different kinds of antibiotics. So um, you've got to, there's only very specific drugs that will kill this, um, and it's, it tends to get worse before it gets better. What does it do? Causes big nasty sores, and if it's untreated, then you know things can fall off. So that's a problem. This, um, Kiana, what is this disorder? You were just in Molokai. Oh, that's leprosy. This is leprosy. Yes, leprosy is a bacterial disorder, and uh, Molokai used to be a, a leper colony, and there are still leprosy patients in in Molokai. Only a few of them. Um, there's a, does anybody know where the last leper colony in the United States is currently found? Louisiana. Um, is the last uh, leper colony. Uh, leprosy is now very easily treated. Um, it takes a long time to go through the treatment, but it's not hard. So we have the drugs that do it, um, but somebody still needs to be treated for like six months before they get better. So typically, people don't get to the point where they need to go to a leper colony. They'll start. They'll notice a white, odd patch on their skin. They'll go to the doctor. The doctor will go, "Ooh, take these drugs for six months, and then you're okay, right?" If it's left untreated, but if you treat it, you know. So um, yeah. So this is uh, another example of a bacterial disease, um, and we are very glad that dead things go away. We've already talked about that. So bacteria cause um, decomposition. This is just a, another, another little picture of binary fission. So in case you needed to see another example of one cell becoming two, that is how almost every bacteria reproduces. Okay, and then there is the opportunity for conjugation. It looks like this. Um, this is one bacterial cell and another bacterial cell, and they have formed a cytoplasm bridge. So one of the cells reached out and touched its neighbor with a little strain of cytoplasm. And then they're going to pass DNA back and forth through that little cytoplasm channel. And when they're done, they will both have different DNA than they started. So this is different than sex, right? Um, because in sexual reproduction, the parents keep the DNA that they've always had. It's the baby that has different DNA. Here, the parents are different. After, this, after the recombination, because they said, here's some of my DNA, thank you, I'll take some of yours. And now they themselves are different, right? So it's, it's not quite the same as sexual reproduction, but it does cause gene mixing and causes some variation in the offspring. Okay, we'll take a moment and write this down. Uh, I'm strange. Okay. <laughs> so structurally, bacteria are very, very simple cells. They are the simplest form of life. Um, and that doesn't mean that they're not amazing. They are. They do what they do very, very, very well. So um, a point was made in one of the videos that you watched earlier in this, in this year that just because it's simple doesn't mean that it's not amazing. Um, if you look at what a bacterial cell was designed to do, it does it incredibly well with the simple tools that it has. Uh, and so not all machinery needs to be really, really complicated, right? Uh, what it was designed to do, it does well. But it is the simplest form of life. 
So no membrane-bound organelles. There is nothing in the cell that, that is wrapped in a membrane. So there's no nucleus, there's no Golgi apparatus, there's no endoplasmic reticulum, there's no lysosomes, there's no vacuoles, there's none of that. Nothing that is wrapped in a membrane. So it only has non-membrane organelles like ribosomes. It does, it does have those. Um, and it has a region in the cell where the DNA is stored, but that region is not wrapped in the membrane. That region is just a region. And so we call it a nucleoid region because it's that part of the cell that has DNA, okay, nucleoid region. Um, all the DNA that it has will be in one chromosome. So if you have 23 uh, somatic, uh, sorry, 23 chromosomes, and you have two of each of them, so you've got a total of 46 in your cells, they will have one chromosome. And that one chromosome will have all the DNA that you need. Okay, some of those one chromosomes are very big, but it is only ever going to be one chromosome. Okay, they frequently have flagella. Bacterial flagella are, are common. Not every cell, obviously not every kind of bacteria has flagella, but lots of them do. And the bacterial flagella, as we have discovered, is an amazing machine. It's a rotary motor in the cell. And all the parts that you need for a rotary motor are in the cell. Um, and so if you were to look at like a, a propeller on the back of a boat or a motor that comes uh, that, that turns uh, something in a, in a DC car, an electric car or something like that, all the parts that are there is in the bacterial cell. And it's an incredibly well-designed thing. Um, it's the little propeller that moves the cell forward through its environment. Um, they do have a cell wall, but we don't call it a cell wall because a cell wall like plants have is a little different. So because it's a little bit different chemically than a plant, we don't say the bacterial cell wall, we say the bacterial capsule. But it's still the same idea. It's a rigid, protein-dense um, structure that, that keeps this, the cell in, the, in a shape. It's not squishy like an animal. Okay. So some pictures. This is a typical bacterial cell. Um, it has a, uh, oops, just kidding. It has a, um, th that capsule there, and then it'll have a mem membrane underneath it. It does have cytoplasm. It will have organelles, but it will have organelles that don't wrap themselves in membranes, okay? And then it'll have this pile of DNA in the middle, the, the nucleoid region, okay? And frequently, it will have a flagellum. Very simple cells. We name bacteria according to what they look like, the shape of the cell, and the groupings of the bacteria, how they are, how they arrange themselves in nature. So take a moment, write that down, we'll be right back to you. So the, uh, the three kinds of bacteria, when you look at them under a scope, starting on Wednesday, you will see the bacteria come in three shapes either little circles, little round like, like peas, um, or rods, or corkscrews. Those are the three shapes of bacteria. And all of the amazing diversity of bacterial life only comes in three shapes. Okay? So we name bacteria based on the kinds, uh, the, the, the shape of it. Bacillus will be somewhere in the name if it is rod shaped. Okay. Caucus will be somewhere in the name if it is spherical. And spirillum will be somewhere in the name if it is a corkscrew shape. So it'll have more stuff in its name, but it'll have those things in there if it is one of those three shapes. And there's no more than those three shapes. Then the three groupings of them. Um, bacteria can occur in pairs where one bacteria and his friend are hanging out together. And their cell walls, their, their capsules will be fused so that they stay just the two of them. Okay? Then we would say that that is a diplo of some kind. And we'll use that as a prefix. So we might say diplobacillus. And diplobacillus would be two rod shaped bacteria stuck end to end, hanging out for the rest of their lives together as friends. Okay? Um, and then staphylo is a cluster, it looks like a bunch of grapes, just a whole bunch of things all stuck together, okay? Um, so Staphylococcus would be, would look like uh, a microscopic 
cluster of grapes, a whole bunch of round things stuck together. Okay? And then strepto means a chain of them. So streptobacillus looks like a whole bunch of sticks end to end. And they wouldn't necessarily all be straight. They might curve around, but they're all joined end to end, a whole bunch of rods. And so that would be streptobacillus. Streptococcus would be a whole bunch of ball-shaped things strung out together like string pearls. Streptospirillum would look like a continuous long helix that would just be end 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 bacteria spirals joined together. Okay. Staphylococcus is the most common arrangement. Staphylo is just a whole bunch of clusters of round things. Staphylococcus is uh, is most of the time what you'll see is a group of round bacteria hanging out together. Okay. Obviously you'll see more. Um, and when we start to grow things on Friday, you will collect quite a diversity of different kinds of life. And you'll be able to identify different um, combinations of those names. So here's some pictures. This would be two bacteria, rod-shaped, hanging out next to each other end to end. Okay, so this is diplobacillus. This, these are clusters of round things. So what's this? Staphylococcus. Most of the time, that's what you'll see. Okay? Staphylococcus. These are strings of round things. So what's that? Streptococcus. Good. When you get strep throat, that's your friend. Okay? This is a, is a uh, cluster of spiral things. Staphylospirillus, right? Cool. A little bit of information on viruses. All right, the most basic thing that biology will cover is a virus. I put living thing in quotes because it has some of the characteristics of life, but not all of them. And so it is technically not alive. There are some, um, there are some biologists that treat them as if they're alive. And you will hear people say things like, kill the virus. You can't kill something that's not alive. Um, and they will talk about you know, a, a, uh, a dead virus being used for an inoculation. Well, if it's never alive, how is it dead? It does have some attributes of life but it does not have all of the attributes of life, and so it is not technically alive. But they definitely do interact with living things, and they do some of the things that living things do, and so we need to be aware of them. Um, they, they are basically either DNA or RNA that is wrapped in a protein coat. That's all that it is. There is no cytoplasm. There are no organelles. There is uh, nothing that you would recognize as being a cell. It's just DNA with a protein shirt, okay? That's all it is. And we name that protein shirt a capsid, capsid. So a, a capsule, a capsule is the, is the bacteria outer layer. A capsid is the virus outer layer, okay? On its own, it cannot move or reproduce. Viruses don't, you know, go for a job. Viruses don't swim. Viruses don't do anything like that. They travel passively. They have to be moved along by other forces around them, okay? And they do not reproduce on their own. You cannot grow viruses in a petri dish with just them and some food, okay, like you can bacteria. They are terrorists. <laughs> they go in and hijack a host cell and make it produce more of itself. So. A cell can be thought of as a factory. We talked about that way back in chapter three. A cell can be thought of as a factory. It produces proteins, amongst other things. And what happens with a virus is it steps into this factory and says, now you're going to make more of me. And the cell goes, okay, and makes more viruses. Okay? So the cell becomes a virus factory. And the virus... Um, the virus uses the resources of the cell to make more of itself. It on its own cannot reproduce. It on its own cannot move. Um, it does not maintain homeostasis. It does not do a lot of the things that living things do. 
but it definitely controls living things. So this is a picture of various kinds of viruses. Some viruses are round and pokey. The common cold looks like this. Okay, the flu looks like this. Some viruses look like kidney beans. Some viruses are round without the pokey parts. Some viruses have odd other shapes. Um, and then some of them look like this background picture. It looks kind of like a spider with a top hat on. Um, but they all, they all have a unique shape. Um, and these are all examples of viruses. So the two major shapes is the bacteriophage. This is the, the thing that looks kind of like a spider. This is, uh, these viruses tend to attach themselves to bacteria more often than to other kinds of cells, which is why they're called bacteriophage. Um, and then there are other viruses that look like balls with pokey things. The flu virus would be an example of that. But the example, the, the structure is essentially the same. It is a protein coat around DNA. Okay? Um, nothing else that you would call a cell. No, no organ else. No organ else. Um, just protein and DNA. Okay? So here's what happens. Here's how it makes you sick. Okay, so when a virus um, reproduces, it's called, well, it's usually, it usually goes through this process called the lytic cycle. There is another way of doing it, and I'll explain the difference at the end here. But the lytic cycle, um, lysis means to burst or to rupture, to pop. And so it's called the lytic cycle because at the end of the day, the host cell explodes and reduces and, and, re and releases a whole lot of viruses. So that's why it's called the lytic cycle. Um, attachment is the first stage. The virus looks for a particular attachment site on a target cell. And it has to be a particular place. So the virus doesn't get to attach any old place to any old cell. The proteins um, on these leg parts, if it's a bacteriophage, or the proteins on the pokey parts of the ball looking cell, of the ball looking viruses, match with proteins on the outside of the, of the target cell. So this virus can only plug in to a particular location on that cell. And so it is designed for that entry point. If it doesn't find that entry point, then it can't work. It can't function anymore. And the virus will just bounce off and keep floating around until it does find the right entry point. Okay? So that's why particular viruses make you sick in a particular way is because they are looking for a particular cell in your body that they can hook up to and infect that cell. That's why when you get the common cold, you don't all of a sudden get a purple toe. Because it's not looking for toe cells, it's looking for mucous membranes in your sinuses. Right? So um, they attach to a particular attachment site on a target cell. And then they inject the DNA or the RNA that they have inside them into the host cell. So in the bacteriophage structure, the DNA resides up here, the virus plugs into the right point, and this stuff gets injected into the host cell. Okay, it's like a big needle. Once it's in there, the cell, the cell is kind of stupid. The cell has its own DNA in its nucleus. And then it finds DNA in the cell, and it's like, what? How did DNA get into my cytoplasm? Do I have all my DNA? We do. What are that? That must belong to me. I don't know. I don't know how it got out. So it takes the DNA from the cytoplasm and it adds it to its own DNA in its nucleus. And it's like, I don't know. I must have leaked. Right? And now it has added the DNA from the virus to its nucleus, to its nucleus. And now when it starts to read its DNA and ask the question, what am I supposed to do with myself? It reads virus DNA. And it's like, oh, I'm supposed to make viruses. Okay. And so it starts making viruses. And it assembles all the proteins. And it mass produces the virus DNA. And it builds the protein parts instead of building whatever it's supposed to build. So let's talk about the common cold and your mucous membranes. Your mucous membranes are supposed to make snot. Because that the flow of snot down your sinuses and out your nose keeps dirt and particles and mostly viruses from getting into your body. It's washing you, right? That's the purpose of stuff, is to wash you and be inside of you. Well, instead of making that, it makes viruses. 
and then the viruses are being assembled uh, inside the cell instead of the proteins that it should be making, right? And then the cell doesn't have a mechanism for releasing the viruses because the cell isn't supposed to be making viruses. So all the parts of its cell membrane that are supposed to extrude, you know, whatever it is that they're supposed to be making to the outside world, the virus doesn't fit there. The virus doesn't go out there. So more and more viruses are being made, but the viruses aren't being released. And so at some point, the cell pops. It becomes too full of viruses. And the cell, okay, like a, like a balloon. And then that releases viruses. And now all of those viruses land on more cells. And the process continues. And so the only way to stop that is to have your body waiting for one of those cells to pop with a, a white blood cell or something like that that can scoop those up and eat them and destroy them. And that's why, you know, white blood cells are an amazing invention that God has to consume viruses. You can also, um, you can also do some chemical warfare against them. There are some things that your body makes called antibodies that are chemicals that, that break down the virus particle and keep the virus from going and infecting a neighbor cell. So we'll look more at, at how your body fights these things later. But you can see how it becomes a big problem quickly. Because when one cell gets infected by one virus, it's going to release thousands of viruses when it pops. And so now all of those viruses will go and infect other cells, which will all make thousands of that virus and then pop. And those will all go out and infect other cells. So you wind up with this cascade chain reaction of, of viruses being produced, which is why diseases spread as easily as they do. Okay, there is a slight variation to this cycle called a latent cycle, where there is a, a break, uh, a gap in time between when the DNA goes into the cell and when the DNA gets read. And some viruses can sit dormant, sleeping, in the cell for a long time, and then all of a sudden become active. And what triggers them to become active is different for each disease, but as, as an example, um, uh, chickenpox. How many of you guys not uh, didn't get vaccinated, you instead got the actual chicken box. You had chicken boxes. Anybody? Oh, yeah, I guess. You had chicken boxes as a kid. Anybody else? Okay. So I had chicken boxes as a kid. In Brianna's body and in my body, there's actually sleeping viruses. Okay. The, uh, the virus that causes chicken pox does not get killed by your body when you no longer have chicken pox. Your body fights it back and it kind of goes to sleep. But later on in life, the two of us could wind up getting chicken pox in a much different form called shingles. Good time. Shingles is a skin infection. Uh, it's the same virus coming back to life, and it causes huge sores, and it usually happens late in life. So when I'm an old fart, I could get shingles. But if you were vaccinated instead, uh, uh, then, then you were given a dead form of the virus, your body developed the tools to kill varicella zoster, and you don't get that disease. And so you don't have that virus sleeping in your body. You have the ability to kill it. And so um, you won't get shingles, but the two of us may. So that's the way that, that, that's the way that, that happens. Um, so there's a, there's a dormant period. Some viruses sleep for a long time before they start acting again. And then there is an option, um, if the cell can figure out a way to eject viruses from itself without popping, there are some cells that can just release viruses and survive. But that's actually a worse situation because now the cell isn't dead and the cell just keeps producing viruses. So that's an even worse problem, is if you now have a healthy virus factory in your body. Um, so there are some variations to that, but not a lot. Okay, um, I think I've got a couple of pictures before we're done. I think, I think we're done. Is it the last right slide? Yes, this is the last right slide. Yeah, so that's a picture of the lytic cycle. Um, the, the virus attaches, injects its DNA, makes virus particles, gets too full and pops, and then they come out. And out it goes again to repeat the process. Okay. So there you go. Any questions? What happens if you 
Uh, it's gone. All topics. Well, it wasn't really alive, but yes, it's not. It doesn't do anything else. Yeah. Cool.